Hello, everyone. How, how is everybody doing today? Hello, everyone. All right, AppSec California. Um, you're, we're here to talk about the application security verification standard. I want to talk about the trajectory of how a lot of organizations or individuals get exposed to the application security industry. And that on-ramp right now is really the OWASP top 10. And I want to help us make the migration from the OWASP top 10 as the entry point into application security and really try to bring people to the ASVS, the Application Security Verification Standard. This is something comprehensive. This is something that we can base an entire application security program off of it's such a detailed standard, and so that, that's the goal of this talk. My name is Jim Manico. I'm going to be your speaker today. I'm a former board member of the OWASP Foundation. I'm a project manager for like a half dozen OWASP projects. One of my favorites is the Cheat Sheet series. It's like a living encyclopedia of a bunch of secure coding knowledge that about 100 different people work on. So that, that's a great project to learn about secure coding. I've been developing software most of my adult life. Wrote a book on the topic, and I'm a resident of Hawaii and Virginia. Long story for another time. You can also reach me at Jim single quote or single quote one single quote not equal single quote at manico.com. No, no, you shouldn't do that. No, you shouldn't do that. Don't email me there. <laughs> By the way, do you think this is a real email address? Do you think this is a legitimate, like if, you were, if your security was going to be input validation and you have an email validator just check is valid email address? You think this is a valid email address? Yes. What? I got a yes from, from a, a very astute professional combatant up front. So anybody else want to chime in? Any no's? Yeah. This is not, not only is this a valid email address, it's absolutely RSC compliant. It's active. It's actually one of my email addresses. So if you're like, I don't believe, go ahead, send me an email. Your mileage may vary. If you're injected, this is a SQL injection attack payload. So if it attacks your client, I warn you, this is... Proceed with caution, but this is active, and I'll, I'll respond to your doubting email with one word. I'll say, believe. It's real. It's real, baby. So, like, you know, it's just neat. A lot of us talk about how to defend applications. The, the point I'm trying to make when I show this is even valid data that's gone through your validation layers can still cause injection and do harm in other ways to a piece of software. So anyways, I digress. Let's get, that, that's just a little, a little tidbit to get us warmed up. Let's get, the, let's get this talk started. You're a little late to my talk, but that's all right. No, what is it, 203? I'm sorry, I'm, forgive me for starting a little on timer. So this is, the, <laughs> this is the OWASP top 10, and I think this is Im important because it is a large number of people's on-ramp and introduction into application security, in particular web security. Can anybody tell me why this has become the on-ramp to application security? What vehicle, what driver pushes people to look at this as their first entry into application security? Why? Something, I agree, but something specific pushes people to that checklist. I, that, that might be true, but something specific, something that's not a law, but it's, a, it's in the world of governance. PCI, PCI baby, where anyone processing a credit card is governed by PCI, uh, the, the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard. And this is not a law, but it will force additional financial fines on your company to process credit cards if you don't follow it. And they have for years cited the OWASP top 10. And that leads us here. And frankly, one of my main jobs is to write PowerPoints and talk. It's a great job. If you can do it, do it. So I, I talk for a living. So for me as a speaker and as an educator, I love the OWASP Top 10. It is a great vehicle to spread awareness. It's a great excuse to talk about 10 completely haphazard and random topics in application security. This is supposedly a risk list. These are not all risks. Some of these are weaknesses. Some are vulnerabilities. Some are very narrow and specific, like XXE. Some of these are like giant, broad categories that we could spend months talking about, like authentication and identity in general. This is probably the most haphazard, slapped together list I've ever seen. But, it's, but it, that's OK. It wasn't made to be some kind of comprehensive document. It was made for like a keynote or made for an awareness training or meant as a first thing to read as an on-ramp. 
and that's okay, but the problem is, is we standardized on this. People now say, I follow the OWASP Top 10 standard, or I base my security program on the OWASP Top 10, or I base my entire multi-trillion dollar set of rules around processing credit cards around the OWASP Top 10. This is, this is insanity. So we gotta get past this. Now, I still love talking about it. So like when this came out of just a couple years ago, these three topics were new. And I think it's really valuable. So I don't want to say that the OS Top 10 doesn't add value because XXE, if you're a red teamer or a real world attacker, XXE is a problem. Greg, there's been a plethora of incidents with XXE over the last couple of years. Plethora. What's, we were debating earlier, what's a plethora? Is it two? Is it three? This is a different story. We'll talk about this later. But XXE is a real problem. A lot of us are still running legacy-based XML web services. And as an attacker, I can do a very simple malformed XML object that's using an external entity, which I can use to read files off your server in a relatively trivial fashion. This was becoming back in 2016 era, such an epidemic of a problem in terms of real world exploits. As a red teamer, I see your server, you're serving up XML, one XXE, boop, and I got the password file off the OS of that server, done. I'm root on that box eventually with, with, with modest analysis. And so this helped spread awareness about that real serious problem. It's not even exciting, it's XML, we're in the world of JSON, but it, spread, it helped spread that awareness in a big way. Same thing with insecure deserialization. This showed up in our world. We knew about this. When, when did people first start seeing deserialization research out there? Any, anyone an early adopter or early eyeball on deserialization problems? When did we first start talking about this? Come on, if you're an AppSec, deserialization? This is like an apocalypse a couple years ago. It was pretty bad. For like, for years, like, two, we're talking 2012, the original chatter about this problem shows up. Deserialization. This is when I send an untrusted, typically a stream of binary, XML or JSON, up to an endpoint that serializes that data in some way. And, and uh, uh, this is just not a safe thing to do from untrusted data. Almost every language suffers from this. And this was becoming a really widespread problem. And why this was so bad in this era is because a lot of vendors were pushing out fixes, especially in the Java ecosystem, around how to fix this problem. And it was, it was half and half in terms of noble versus marketing, right? It was noble. Companies are spending time to push out fixes to this deserialization problem in Java in a big way, in the open source way. But it was also kind of iffy because they're trying to get some press about what they were doing. And if you look at the analysis of that era of defense, they were all ineffective defenses that they were pushing out. So it's a really hard issue to fix. We have in Java, it got such a problem, such a problem in Java, they pushed out a whole new JEP, a whole new AP, a function layer in Java to protect against this and backported it to Java 6. So the OWASP top 10 helped breed awareness about these really critical issues back in 2017. This is a bit stale of an issue in 2019 and 2020. So I mean, this is good. I like it, but we got to get beyond it. And, and how about A10, insufficient logging and monitoring? This is not a very sexy topic. It's not very exciting, but it, it you know, it breed a little awareness that we should be logging effectively. And so I, it, this forced me to talk about it in class as an educator. I always thought logging was boring and it's not worthy of an education class. So I usually kept it off my list. I have bitter, bigger things to talk about in the world of security. Then this shows up on the OWASP top 10 my customers really forced me to talk about it. So I had to do a little research and looked into it and I'm like, you know what? This is a topic I should have been talking about for many more years. There's a lot of interesting stuff in the world of logging, in particular security logging, and how little programming languages support doing that. But there is a lot to be said in that area. So that forced me as an educator to push forward and talk about newer things, even though things that seem boring. So I like the OS top 10, but you can't base a security program off of this. You can't base a tool or a company or a training program, you can't base it off the OWASP top 10. And this is where the ASVS shows up. So a couple years ago, we have like, uh, Jeff Williams, Dave Wickers, 
uh, Mike Baberski and a few others, uh, oh, I believe almost 10 years ago, they started this project, the ASVS standard, the Application Security Verification Standard. And what this really is, this is really the WASIV. This is really the web application verification standard because we now have all these forks off of, off of this idea of a clear checklist for secure coding on the web. We have the massive, the mobile application security project. We have the growth of an IoT version of this standard, which we footnote, which, which we have an appendix for. It's not in the key standard, but we have some mentions of it. So this is really the web application security verification standard. And even though it was started as a checklist, it, it, it grew into a real clear, hopefully well-vetted open community standard that you can use to literally base an entire application security program off of. The reason why I like this so much is because the question I ask a lot to teams are, what do you define security to be? Real simple question. What do you define security to be in the context of software? And what kind of answers do I get? I get a lot of philosophical answers. We want the application to only behave as intended, or we don't want it to be attacked. This is philosophy, but we're scientists. I can't write secure code with the philosophy. I, got, I need a real mission. And this is why ASVS is important. It's essentially about a 280 plus requirement document meant to define clearly what a secure piece of software is. Now, that's the answer to my, that question in my mind. What's a secure piece of software? Well, it's a piece of software that's been tested, built, designed, et cetera, all with these 280 plus requirements in mind. Training any activity that we want to do in the world of application security, we can, we can build that around this clear list of requirements, no matter what you're doing. So, and the other key thing is, the goal of this standard is not just to copy our vision. Like when we built the standard, Andrew Vanderstock, Daniel Cuthbert, um, Josh Grossman are really the, the leaders who pushed, did, did the main work in this. Josh Grossman, in this version, one of our biggest volunteers in terms of time spent working on this. With tons and tons of, of requests over GitHubs and comments and debates around what we should put in here. And every single one of those debates is done in public. There's none of this was done behind closed doors. There's no cabal of secret in intellectual people making these decisions to support their products or any of that BS. This is done in the clear, in GitHub, in public, encouraging these discussions to make sure we get it right. So, and then the thing, the key thing is we do agree that, that this is the best that we can come up with around this era, but we think that you and your teams should fork this. We think you should grab a copy of these 280 plus requirements and go through a vetting process in your company and, and change it up specific to what you're doing. Like one of my customers took the, like the many dozen authentication requirements. And as a side note, I'm gonna come back to this. As a side note, we did a lot of work on authentication. There's a new publication from NIST that came out a few years ago, which really changed the world of digital identity. You familiar with this document? Beautiful, right? This is NIST 863 A, B, and C. Um, and, and it's, in particular, I highly recommend, if you're an AppSec professional working in the world of identity, go read NIST 863 B in particular. And it, it did things like change the world of password policy like no other modern document ever has. They refer to credential stuffing, common password list, they really force multi-factor for even the, the most minor sensitive data. They're recommending 64-character um, passwords or longer being supported. Now, NIST actually said that eight-character passwords were okay, and the ASVS team pushed that up to 12. We were a little gun-shy to agree with NIST on that call for eight-character eight, pass, eight passwords. But the point of the author of, of the NIST document was, if you're doing all of these newer defenses, multi-factor, um, looking for contextual word matches and passwords, uh, the uh, 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 supporting very large lengths, supporting Unicode characters, blocking brute force attacks in some way, and really addressing how authentication layers are attacked in the modern world, and especially with multi-factor in play, then long passwords are no longer important. I think, I, I, don't, I don't agree, I, I'm gonna go for 12 as my policy, but it's a compelling argument that, that, that speaks to the point that how we've addressed passwords for the last decade or two 
uppercase, lowercase, number special character, it's not an effective policy. It never was. And so I think it's, it's, it's great to read this NIST document. We st one of the biggest changes to ASVS, the standard in version 4.0, was to grab these requirements and integrate them into ASVS in some way. And uh, again, I think it's a real valuable way to base an entire security program um, off of this standard. It's a, a, a great document to do that kind of activity. And the people that worked on this is, is quite a large list. Again, um, Andrew Vanderstock, Daniel Cuthbert are the two original modern leads of this project. Josh Grossman jumped into version 4.0 and put in an epic effort. I did a lot of the 3.0 version was my big effort. So every version, usually a new leader shows up and helps really put a lot of energy in to drive review of these requirements. It's a bit of a grind of a project. There's a, a plethora of comments that come in and need to be triaged and commented on. And sometimes one small comment will trigger a large debate or a large rewrite. What, one of the biggest efforts in this version was also getting rid of duplication of ideas across requirements, which is highly debatable and triggered a lot of, lot of late night discussions. The other thing that's new is we, we moved the whole standard to Markdown, which lets us push the document out in many different, different styles very easily. We stole this from one of our one of our sibling projects, the Mobile Application Security Project. Uh, and I give them credit. These guys copied ASVS and took it to a whole new level in terms of detail. I'm really proud of this team. They really, the, the effort for the mobile ASVS is so much more detailed than what we have at the, at the web ASVS. We're talking about high-level web security principles. And the MASVS, they're talking about like Android and iOS, really specific security requirements. Great, great piece of artifact. Great artifact if you care about mobile security programming. It's another, I, I could base an entire mobile secure coding AppSec program off of that standard, absolutely. And again, we brought this up to compliance with NIST 863, the Digital Media Identity Authentication Guideline from NIST. And we, and we were debating about whether or not to add IoT requirements. We decided not to. We decided to let them split off into a whole different standard to keep the main ASVS web only. But we did add one of their main chapters in, in the appendix to acknowledge this other project. So really, we, we see ASVS splitting apart based on the major frameworks of the day. Love it. Now, what we've added as well into version 4.0 is requirements around some of the changes happening in modern web, web development. Even though like SQL injection is still fixed by parameterized queries and not by validation, the way that we're delivering applications has changed radically in the last couple of years. So we see containers, serverless kind of development. The, ma the major rise to a APIs is now the main way of building software. Like back in the day, old school web apps are becoming the not, no longer the norm. Doing JavaScript client side frameworks, talking to APIs is really quickly becoming the norm in web development. We're addressing those kind of architectures. And because of the rise of JavaScript client side frameworks, STOM XSS is becoming a much more important issue that's really difficult to find in the world of assessment. And also, we're looking at automatic templating technologies to build web UIs that help stop XSS automatically. We're addressing some of those changes as well. So this is a hard standard to maintain. The world of web tech, it moves pretty fast. Who, who here does web security for a living? Who's, that's a, how do you keep up? Got, guy with the beard in the middle. Not, not, not that guy with the beard, the middle beard guy. You don't program anymore, so you, you talk about it, so you don't really, so, so you work on slides. Well, the, the question was, how do you keep up? And your answer was, I don't code, I work on PowerPoints. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on. The other, the most frequent request we got about delivering ASVS 4.0 was to map ASVS, each individual requirement and map it to a CWE, a common weakness enumeration value. And there's about 800 CWEs that, that have been set up by MITRE. Um, now let's, let's, let's hold here for a second. ASVS is a list of controls. Parameterize your queries. Set your passwords to be 64 characters or longer for the max length. Really individual granular tactical 
requirements for a programmer or, or for a penetration tester. CWE is a high-level weakness category idea. These are not controls. These are more high-level ideas, and there's no way to map them together perfectly. So it's, it's, it's an inappropriate request that we got 100 plus times, so we, we did it anyways, and it, but it's, it's an incomplete, imperfect, not realistic mapping. But we have at least something in there for most requirements. Not every item ended up having a CWE mapping for whatever reason. And, you know, and that decision was a big deal. It actually, some people could only do with, deal with requirements if they had a CWE because of some esoteric rule or law they were following. So this became a big deal to some folks. I don't have a lot of visibility into that, but I, I, I digress. So also, what's changed about the individual requirements? Again, people have based programs off this list, have based their company or their product off of earlier versions of ASVS. So as we move to version 4.0 and make these changes, for some of you this may seem esoteric, but for those of you who've been using ASVS for several versions and these requirement numbers matter, as we suddenly renumber the whole standard, that messed with people's world quite a bit. So that's why we did a whole new version of the standard. This may not be a big deal to you, but that's okay. <clears throat> we also decided not, because we would, for example, we would have like ASV item 1, 2, 3, 1.1, 1.2, and 1.3. So we would get rid of 1.2, and in the next version, leave that number skipped. And, then the ver and the standard would eventually become, all right, 1.1, 1.3, 1.8, and it wasn't linear, it was getting messy to keep up with that backward compatibility. So for 4.0, we gave up on that and just renumbered everything starting from scratch. That, and again, and we also got rid of a massive number of duplicate ideas throughout the standard, which took a lot of fine tooth editing to, to get that done right. This is a mammoth amount of, of effort to, to, to pull this off. Okay, so the other part about ASVS, let's get a little closer into what, this re what these requirements look like. All right. You see this L1, L2, L3? Every requirement in the standard is going to map to uh, one of three different levels. Either you're level one only, you're level one and level two, or you're all three, level one, two, and three. Level one is the new baseline. That's basic. Level one is essentially, this is the security requirement that all web or API applications really should be following. We tried to make these basic technical, and testable. So someone who's a pen tester should be able to do a full level one review of a Weber API application. And that's our criteria for making it a level one requirement. And, and, and the, the idea is that you want to go beyond level one. So I, I think penetration testing is important. And I don't want to say stop penetration testing. Stop only penetration testing. We really want to move into hybrid reviews. The world of assessment tools has gotten pretty prolific. There's now, there's, there's dynamic, there's web scanners, dynamic analysis, static analysis, third-party library security scanners, and the up-and-coming world of IaaS, like integrated scanning technology. So there's like a four whole families of scanning technology that we want to automate in addition to doing penetration testing. A pen test alone only gives us so much visibility into the app. So, we're in this great era where we should be able to automate a lot of our security testing so we can take what pen testing resources we do have and have them target critical things like our crypto system or authentication layer, things that are more difficult for automation to test. So level one is level that every app should follow. Level two is for heavy duty finance and very sensitive data. Level three is for infrastructure. It's like you're, you're building software for a vehicle that shoots missiles or something like that. You probably wanna look at level three requirements as well. That's not the greatest thing to say here in lovely California. Let's just move on. Let's just ignore that. We'll ignore that. We're moving on. We're moving on. So, uh, and, and to make the ASVS a little bit more in alignment with PCI DSS 6.5 and above, we included some legacy things that we really didn't want, that really shouldn't, don't really matter that much to me in a web app, but still matter. Like buffer overflow still, still matters, especially to, to infrastructure of the web, integer and safe string operations. I always used to, we, they're a minor issue, but they really matter in the world of finance and calculation. Um, making sure folks compiled code properly, build chain type stuff. So all these esoteric things 
that we had removed in the past as being not that, we thought were not that important, PCI kind of informed us that we do want to bring it back in. Because even though PCI is imperfect, it matters to a lot of people who use the ASVS. It's really our first, our first big wave of customers came from, our, you know, customers, our first big wave of companies that use this standard actively in their work was from the world of e-commerce. But we, we did our best to get rid of our less, our less impactful controls. We tried to shrink the size of the standard, but new stuff came back and it's about the same size. Um, we got rid of things that were like browser specific. We ripped all the mobile stuff out because there are a whole new mobile standards being built independently and very effectively. And we, 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 we had this terrible story. Uh, they, they asked me, Jim, go find an IoT person to build some IoT requirements. So we did that. We got um, Aaron Gutzman and, Dan, and, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and Daniel uh, uh, helped us build an IoT section. They both vetted it. And we had this IoT section. And as soon as it got put in the standard, which I was asked to do by the other team members, they said, let's remove it now. And I got a little upset. And I'm like, look, we just went out and got some pros to do this for us. This has got to be in here. So we, we had this back and forth debate on this, what to do with these requirements that we asked people to build for us that were IoT that we now wanted to remove because we wanted it to be a web-only standard. So we, put, we popped it in the, in, a, in the appendix to still acknowledge their work. And they're working on a whole new standard that's just doing great. Oh, yeah. ASVS, again, makes up 280 requirements. The first section is about architecture. This is probably the least technical of the sections in ASVS. There's, there's over, over a dozen of these sections of requirements that are in this standard. And architecture is a little bit of a soft topic, right? Now we're talking about SDLC, we're talking about process, we're talking about the wonderful activity of drawing pictures on a whiteboard with a, with a pro team called threat modeling. We're talking about that. You know, the whole idea of shifting left and design first. These are all really, in my mind, soft and mushy activities, right? They're important, they're critical, but they're, they're, they're more process-based than technical oriented. And so, but, but you know, this is critical to secure software. Once I'm in production, if I want to redesign something for security, that's mammothly expensive. If I'm on a whiteboard doing, doing virtual design, that's cheap to, to basically free. So the idea of thinking through your security architecture before spending a huge amount of money writing software, it's just common sense. We have a whole section defining the different requirements we would expect to see in a team that's doing mature architecture, SDLC, threat modeling, and the whole idea of designing security before you build, write code. Level two, um, category two of the ASVS is authentication. And the way I define, I've renamed this section in my mind. In my mind, this section is not authentication, it's why I should never build a login page ever again. That's what this section is for me. So when I was helping work on this, I really wanted to like cram in as much insanity as possible to scare people away from building login systems on their own because you got to get credential stuffing, you got to get your com password blocking and handle brute force, and there's so many little things can go wrong. The chance of one of the top programmers in the world building a secure login system is low, and it's really low. So this is the era where I really try to push teams to using some kind of identity provider, or use OIDC and use Google type login or your third party login, or like, or like, or really buckle up and throw a lot of resources at your own code. We now have to deal with like things like OAuth integration and JSON web tokens and key management. Again, identity layers have gotten, have painfully, painfully more, more complex over the years. All right, all right. You'll see in this section a whole new, a whole new set of requirements about passwords, about credential recovery, about when multi-factor matters and what the different kinds of multi-factor. It's interesting that NIST 863, which we stole the requirements from, they also really thumbs down SMS. They're really trying to keep us away from SMS. And, and I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I went with it. This is what the standard, this is what NIST says, this is what Fenton says. Vanderstock agrees with this. A lot of people write about why we shouldn't use SMS for multi-factor. 
the biggest bank in the world still does it. Chase and all the big banks still do it. I think it's okay. I'm actually, I, I, as opposed to just doing password-based authentication, I think going to SMS multi-factor is a step in the right direction. You, what do you think? So I think Are you okay? You don't like that? Well, so I don't, uh, what, what, what was this? There's a conflation at, on Twitter happening. Yeah. So my talk on this global OAuth standard just got reduced to a conflation on Twitter. No, no, no. So no, I'm okay with that. No, no, let's bring it on, bring it on. There's a lot of anti-SMS for multi-factor uh, talks out there, Standard, substandards being written, corporate policies being written. I mean, I've seen a whole generation of AppSec, stand, of AppSec custom standards thumb down SMS, and I think that's, a, I think that's a, a bad thing. I think if you're doing password-only authentication, that moving to SMS is a great step up that maturity life cycle. Now, that maturity life cycle ends if you're really doing infrastructure, if you're really trying to protect high-value targets, then we want to move to the, the world of FIDO. And it's, smart. it's one of the only technologies even somewhat resistant to phishing in the modern era is the idea of a YubiKey and a smart card and, and similar cryptographic kind of verification as part of authentication. And this is all mentioned here in the ASC, SVS Section 2. Section 3 talks about session management. We're bringing in the new stateless technologies like JSON Web Tokens. You know, JSON Web Tokens have taken over the world of session management and the world of APIs as APIs go from monoliths to bro broken down microservices, traditional sessions break down. The JSON web token and the digital signature to protect its identity has taken over the world of session management. I've heard some thought leaders in the world of identity, in the world of identity say that all of identity is being reduced to signature verification and it's, it's the JSON web token and that kind of artifact why we're hearing this kind of discussion. And so, and things change. We're changing the idea of timeouts um, for refresh tokens, for app level verification on mobile, on, on, a, on a mobile type workflows. Um, we're, we're addressing federation, things like OpenID Connect, where third party services may do login for your organization and, and similar. In the world of, of access control, we're, we're bringing some cloud requirements in as, as applications become even more distributed and out of our hands in certain situations. We're bringing up ideas around API and REST-based access control. We also added a section around data contextual access control. And, and my big philosophy here is we want to get away from roles. A lot of us use roles as a pep use roles as a hard-coded point of authority and code, something called a policy enforcement point. We're trying to encourage people to get away from roles as hard-coded in code and move to capabilities, like doing verification through a feature name or similar. And all the federal standards that we see from NIST back this up as well. Section 5 in ASVS is around the core principles of input validation, data sanitization, an output encoding or output escaping. And I think this is really fascinating because XSS defense, the whole idea, and it's a big piece of this section is about injection protection, request forgery, and a big section of this is about cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting fascinates me to this day, 2020. And I expect that the standards like content security policy and similar would make cross-site scripting go away. Anybody? Do AppSec assessment on the web as part of their job? Anybody hack with, do you, do you still see cross-site scripting? How often do you see it in assessment? Is it still the most common type of vulnerability that you're finding in your work, everybody? What's that? Sort of? You know, it, it requires three tiers of defense. If the user is submitting a URL, that you're going to render in an anchor tag href attribute, you got to validate to make sure that's not that that's only a legal URL to avoid things like JavaScript URLs and data URLs. If your user is authoring snippets of HTML, you want to run it through a data cleaner, an HTML sanitizer. And if you're rendering data that you want to preserve as if the user typed it in, so as I type in an address, if you want to display it exactly like I typed it in, you want to escape it in some way. And this is nuts. But even with modern frameworks, even with the React and the Angular of the world, we still need to handle three different tiers of security when managing data. And so this version of ASVS 
We got crazy. We went and broke all those rules down as granular as we could to really help beef up the whole idea of when to, again, when to validate, when to sanitize, when to encode, and what that means. We really want developers building user interfaces to be aware of this if you want to achieve security in, in the world of UI. We brought up, we, we did a pretty big change to stored cryptography, where things like secrets management, which back in ASVS3 was an emerging category. How, what, what do you think of secrets management today? I think of it as, like if you're doing crypto, if you're using keys to like sign jots, verify jots, uh, uh, to handle any part of identity, you're building your own custom crypto system, we want to use some kind of key vault, and that which was esoteric a few years ago, is now mainstream, a core part of cloud computing. Those of you building security uh, architectures for software, do you agree? Has, key ma has rigorous key management become more the norm of the kind of work you're doing? Ex excellent, so I, I think that's, that's good as well. We talk about, it's still a difficult, in, difficult in some languages to even do something as simple as generate random numbers, especially at scale. It gets to be even more problematic. So we've, adds, we've tried to beef up cryptography to address modern architectural challenges and modern architectural advances around some of the new componentry that devs have available. Like we try to get the idea across, like if like Java's my world, you shouldn't be building crypto by hand, you should be using a well-vetted library to do some of the complex work for you, like the Libsodiums and the Google Tanks and the, the great crypto libraries that we have of the current age. Air handling, yeah, handle errors. I'm gonna skip that one for now. So data data protection. We're, we're now we're we're talking about some of the uh, some of the uh, non-standard ways that data can be leaked through a web application. For example, we're trying to warn about the dangers of local storage. Why is local storage in a, in a as a quick aside? A lot of standards like OAuth, even OIDC. Other identity standards I've read, they talk about using local storage to store security tokens instead of cookies. If, you, if I put my token in a cookie, what attack category am I at risk to? Like if I'm using a traditional session and a session ID or a jot inside of an HTTP cookie, what kind of vulnerability on the web am, am, am I exposed to? Cross-site request forgery, whoever said that, you're right. So a lot of folks are worried about that, so they want you to move data out of the cookie, which by the way is HTTP only and protected from theft in JavaScript, and they want you to move that super security token to local storage. What do you think of that, of that, of that, uh, that standard or that, that uh, idea that a lot of people have spoken about in different standards? Do you ever see Rick and Morty before by any chance? Do you ever see, he was playing some game, Gary, right? And he's like, Gary's going, Gary ripped up his social security card. He's going, he's going off the, he's, I'm doing that right now. I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm doing, I'm garing you right now. Yeah, this is why, this is why I don't think you should be putting sensitive data in the local storage. There's XSS, here's my local storage harvester, yeah. Little script, walk through local storage, Make a GET request, send your entire local storage one key at a time up to my server, and I even URL encoded it for uh, standards compliance. Yeah, there we go. So yes, it's one XSS, and it's game over, game over local storage. And it's, it's really, a tr I don't think it's bad, it's just a trade-off. If you're gonna shove security tokens into local storage, then you're vulnerable to theft via XSS, but you're usually immune to cross-site request forgery. If you're gonna put your token in a cookie, you're suddenly vulnerable to cross-site request forgery, and you have to manage that, but the token can't be stolen via cross-site scripting. It can be abused and for used in a forged scenario through cross-site scripting, but it can't be stolen anymore. And you know, th that's the trade-off you, you may wanna consider. We talk about that in the standard. V9, communication security, how often Brian, how often should we be using HTTPS, dude? How often? Yes. Is there ever a good excuse to use HTTP? No. No. So that's, that, that, and I think we find, we've been talking like that, I have been at least for a long time. I think we're hitting a point now where I actually see some corporations 
where they have zero cipher, zero plain text traffic in their API architecture, in their API delivery part of their architecture. I see companies that I wouldn't traditionally think of caring about security refuse to ever deploy even open port 80 within their organization. So, and if you look at the uptick of TLS usage across the internet, it's, I don't have the statistics with me, but it's, it's out of control. It's up 80% of the whole web is HTTPS right now. Not, tra not web traffic, but number of sites that support HTTPS. Since ASVS 3.0, what have we seen? We've seen Let's Encrypt show up. We've seen strict transport security preloading become de rigueur and become much more common. All these advances and, and the, the ability to get certificates for free from Let's Encrypt really threw gas on the fire and like blew up the number of people that are implementing HTTPS. So I, I look forward to the day when we have a web that is only served over HTTPS and I see that future right before us. It's happening. Um, the, the growth we've seen over the last 10 years is no, no doubt it's exponential in terms of how good we're doing at communication security. <sighs> Malicious code, I'm, I'm gonna skip this one as well. The, the, uh, privacy in dating libraries are coming up for the first time. I, 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 no, no attack on Google, but we're starting, we're starting to address the problem that if you're using some third party trackers or if you're using some third party advertising platforms in your application, you're, gonna, you're violating certain privacy laws at this point, or you have, you have privacy issues that are showing up in your application that you may not expect just because you're getting a little bit of advertisement revenue. And we're trying to address some of these, thir these third party privacy and malware type issues on the web for the first time. 11, business logic verification. This is, this is where DevOps falls apart. This is a really important uh, section in my world. Many of my customers, uh, I, I, they no longer want to spend money on pen testers because they're expensive. And I think pen testing is very important, don't get me wrong, but they, they, want, to, they want to move away from pen testing so that a lot of people have invested heavily, a lot of organizations have invested heavily in this whole DevOps movement. And I, I honestly reduce all of DevOps. I know you get mad at me, but I reduce all of DevOps to automating security testing. I know you don't like that. Oh no, Jim, you're missing the philosophy of DevOps. Yes, I am. Let's move on. So anyway, so we're doing a lot of automated security testing now. In fact, big companies have invested millions in this with great success. One of my customers was the early adopter of this. They, they got attacked badly because of their shopping cart. Now their shopping cart what are the steps of a shopping cart? Who's with me? I add stuff to my shopping cart. I check out. I set up my shipping address, set up my payment address, and I finish checking out. Good enough, right? If you were an attacker, what step would you want to skip? What, what step might you want to skip there, Greg? The payment step. Yeah, who wants to pay? So you just hard code a forced browsing attack and skip the payment step and go right to checkout. And, in, and this customer got bit by that, lost a couple million dollars on that. Now they're throwing a dozen scanners at their web app, and guess what? Every single web scanner on the planet missed this very simple step-skipping attack against an e-commerce application. Why? Because a business logic issue. It's cause, even though it's e-commerce, it's a multi-step transaction. It's, a, it's, a, it's business logic. And again, our $100,000 scanners are not gonna ever find problems like this. So we have a, a bunch of requirements that, th that basically force the developers and, and security teams down the road of designing their business logic stuff carefully, looking for some of these problems like step skipping attacks and timing problems and similar. There's a, there's, and, the, and I, I hate this section. It's really hard to get this section right. So this is one of the sections I, I recommend. If you're gonna fork the standard for your team, give this one a lot of scrutiny. And I can, when I have, whenever I fork the standard with customers of mine, I convert these generic business logic um, requirements into business logic specific requirements about the things we're trying to build. I have a lot better, better luck communicating that. Like rather than say, be careful about step skipping attacks a requirement, I say, make sure an attacker trying to skip the payment step in the e-commerce site will, get, will, will detect that. I try to make it really explicit to have developers be able to react to it. Just an idea that 
put some scrutiny on this as you're forking the standard for your own team. Real basic stuff around files and resources. It is a major revamp, but these are real basic requirements. Things like LFI and RFI. This is like a, a, a malicious file inclusion. This is when you have like a load file statement with the parameter that the attacker can drive in some way and load files into a page from a third party. We've known about this stuff for a long time. We just reorganized this section to make it a bit cleaner. And API security, we're bringing in the cores discussion. The whole world is moving again to JavaScript clients. And these JavaScript clients are frequently using APIs from a multitude of different origins. Why is that a problem for JavaScript developers that their clients are now making API requests to multiple origins? What's the problem? Cores, that's right, good answer. Core. And so we finally, we got new cores requirements in here to discuss this in, in detail. We also brought the idea, you're not gonna believe this, some developers do this. They build SQL in JavaScript, they build a query language in JavaScript and then send that query to the server. That's insane! No, that's GraphQL, Greg, that's fine. So we, we put some requirements, we put some requirements up about, about that and some of the issues, uh, access control and performance issues around that whole idea. Yeah, you got a conf configuration. So much of our infrastructure is now a big YAML file. Yeah, YAML. So we talk about that kind of issue. All right, so we're, we're, we're winding down. Again, you can use these standards in almost any area of application security. Hopefully, this becomes a common language that all of your teams or team or individual can speak when talking about these software security issues, especially when you're doing cross-department discussions, especially when your pen testers who speak the security language and your developers who speak developer's language, when those two teams try to discuss security problems that have been discovered, that's like two alien races with different languages talking to each other. But if both teams are using the ASVS requirements to drive their work, we now have a, a mapping layer between our worlds to communicate how we get this done and really release and manage secure software. I recommend you fork this for your own organization. I even recommend you fork it for each individual application if you got a little bit of time to kill. But the goal is to start here and make it as relevant to your team as possible. Version 4.0.1 was released in March of 2019. That's the current live version. We really want your help on this as well. This is an open standard. It's built by a large community of professionals. If you want to help us translate, want to help us work on 5.0, if you are opinionated and don't like one of our requirements, we really want to hear from you in GitHub in a recorded way that we can track and address for the next version. That's how community standards get done in the open. And some of these debates I did not want to have. I wanted to just get, check, it's done. That's the requirement, let's move on. And then, we, then, then a, a comment shows up at the last minute. So what do we do? We stop, we listen, and do our best to address it. And that's how community, community standards get built. If you have questions for me about ASVS, OWASP, AppSec, or anything else, I am Jim, single quote, or, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm Jim at manicode.com, Jim at OWASP.org. I have a minute and 20 seconds before I wrap up. Any questions? Yes, sir, Brian. The air, okay. you have a and 20 Dude, you're the man. No, no, you're the man. I'm, I'm, I'm down on air handling, but it's, it's important. What do you want to say about what do you want to say about air handling? <laughs> in air handling, I, I'm in my world. What shows up the most is rest. So we encourage REST-based air handling codes that are standard across your team. But be careful. If I say 401 unauthorized, when you're trying to access a resource, what did I, and I say you're access denied, what else did I just tell you? I just told you it exists. So I try to give really generic error codes in public, like a 400 and you're out, and I'll log what the detail is. The other thing is web-based error codes, HTTP error codes that REST tells us to use, they're usually not detailed enough. So I usually have HTTP error codes and an app level custom error code that's more verbose. I usually point people to the PayPal error code API document, which has like several hundred error codes way beyond HTTP to show what one of those standards would look like. 
And, and uh, these, are, these are really, this is the first time we really address this. These are super basic. I skipped it for a reason. So just basic stuff. Another area you may want to augment if this is an important category for your team. I'm done. It is a great honor to be here. Thank you all for caring about application security. Enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. Thank you so much. Yeah.